there is your very stern announcement. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chi. I'm with the Health Commons Solutions Lab team. Um, many of you who are here are part of the Community Ambassadors uh, Network, but we know we've opened up this conversation to folks uh, in the larger community. Um, we're being joined this morning by Dr. Tally Bogler, uh, who's a co-founder of the Pandemic Pre uh, Pregnancy Guide and uh, uh, on staff at St. Michael's uh, Unity Health Toronto. Um, we're really delighted to have her here to take us through um, some of the, the, the basics around pregnancy, fertility, and, uh, and COVID-19. Um, so um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bogler to, uh, to take us through the session. So if you have questions during the session, feel free to pop them in the chat. We will do a dedicated Q&A. Um, if it's a pressing one, use the raise hand function and we can take the questions as we go. Does that work with you, Dr. Bogler? Yeah, for sure. Great. Okay. So um, with that, I'll turn the floor over to, to Dr. Bogler. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for having me again. Um, I know so many people have questions, not just our patients and our clients, but providers too. And I love talking about this because I think the more that we can empower our clients and our patients to understand their bodies and their health and their risk, I think, you know, that's the best form of advocacy that we can, you know, empowering with knowledge. And so that's why I love to share what I know and also love to hear from you what you've been experiencing and the questions that you have. So together we can come up with answers that are evidence-based, that are relatable, and then we can all work with, okay? So I really, we can have this as informal as possible. I will go through some evidence and studies, but I'm happy for you to interrupt me as, as we go. Um, I have nothing to disclose uh, whatsoever. Again, um, thanks for giving a shout out to Pandemic Pregnancy Guide. Um, and this is actually the reason we created this uh, Instagram account for the exact reasons that I just mentioned that I did feel and my colleagues did feel that we wanted to empower women and our patients with the knowledge to better understand their health and the risks during COVID-19. And we thought it would just be for our patients at St. Michael's Hospital, but it now has over 30,000 followers. And I know that not all of our communities and clients necessarily use Instagram, but it is free. And um, some of my patients that come in at St. Michael's Hospital, um, even if uh, they don't typically have internet access, most of them do have a cell phone and sometimes can access um, Instagram. And so I just showed them how to access Instagram and I showed them the site. And many of them I see are continuing to follow our Instagram site. Um, so just a few objectives for today. This is a talk I gave uh, a few weeks ago and I, I am gonna skip a few things specifically about mRNA and adenovirus vector vaccines given how things have changed so rapidly over the last few weeks. Um, talk a little bit about you know, the last five months and what has evolved in terms of the vaccine in pregnancy, what are some of the data in terms of its safety and effectiveness when we give this vaccine in pregnancy and for breastfeeding individuals, some tools that have been created to help people actually make a decision and together kind of come up with practical answers that we can use for the most common questions. Um, this is our Instagram account. Um, just a screenshot from a few weeks ago, actually, we have more than 30,000 followers now. Um, and they're primarily based in Ontario, many from Toronto, but now it spans across Canada and we have some American followers as well. This is our team. Um, and on our Instagram account, we've had several live Q and A's where we come together at 8 p.m. Um, so this one in the left bottom corner, I did uh, myself and an infectious disease specialist from Ottawa. And we had about 900 participants and we just sort of announced it the day before and 900 people came on, logged on and were able to answer uh, many questions that came in. Um, so before we get going, I, I just wanna start off um, just highlighting what things have looked like specifically in Ontario over the last month. And I'm sure many of you have seen the headlines um, coming out of Toronto and other places in Canada showing the higher rates of ICU admissions, hospital admissions um, in pregnant individuals who were contracting COVID-19 over the last month. And this is specifically in wave three. Um, and 
you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were these case reports out of China and certain places in the world that were actually saying maybe pregnant people don't have a higher risk of more serious outcomes from COVID-19. Um, but over the last year that has really evolved and we now have a better understanding of the virus and we now know that pregnant individuals who contract COVID-19 are at higher risk of developing more serious outcomes, primarily higher rates of hospital admissions, um, ICU admissions, um, and preterm birth and other serious outcomes. And we know the more severe the symptoms they are, the more serious the outcomes are. And symptoms seem to be worse when they get the vaccine, when they get the virus, sorry, in the third trimester. And people sort of ask, like, why is that? Why is it that pregnant women are getting more sick? Well, there's a couple, a couple of reasons why pregnant individuals in general can be more susceptible to more serious illness. And that has to do with immunological reasons, anatomical reasons. So when you think about it, when I explain it to my patients, as the uterus and the pregnancy and you progress and gets bigger, it's harder and harder to breathe. That's a simple anatomical thing that most people can understand. And this is not new to us. We see this also with the flu season and influenza. We see pregnant women getting more sick from the flu and ending up in the ICU or being admitted to hospital. Um, I'm just looking, sorry. Okay. Um, so let's go into a little bit. Sorry, was there a question? Nope. Okay, great. Um, so this is another study just looking at, um, it's a, a meta-analysis and a systematic review looking at pregnancy outcomes and again showed higher rates of preeclampsia, um, preterm birth, stillbirth, and the more severe symptoms someone has, the more at risk someone has of developing um, these more serious outcomes in pregnancy. Again, further international evidence showing that, um, again, pregnant women with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 infection are more at risk of severe maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, and again, as I was saying before, at first we didn't know what the risk was in the pregnant population, but now it is pretty much accepted worldwide that we know there are more harmful outcomes if a pregnant person were to contract COVID-19. Now, I just wanna say one thing. The majority of pregnant women do have mild to moderate symptoms, okay? Um, but still there is an absolute increased risk of more serious illness, specifically in the third trimester and specifically in women that do have more um, severe symptoms will have obviously more serious pregnancy and maternal outcomes. Does that make sense? And in terms of Canada data, again, this is Canadian-wide data. It's based out of UBC, um, a CanCOVID preg registry data that has just been looking at pregnancy outcomes in women with COVID-19. And again, it points to a higher rate of hospitalization, ICU admission in pregnant individuals compared to non-pregnant individuals. So I think when I try to just break it down to my patients, I think we say we have international data and very good Canadian data pointing to at a higher risk of more serious outcomes in pregnancy oh, with COVID-19. I don't know if somebody wanted to ask a question, so I'll, I'll move on. Okay, yep, we're okay? Yeah, okay. So let's talk about the vaccine. Now that we know there's an increased risk, let's talk about what we know about the safety and the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnancy. And I wanna point out to this particular study um, in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, it was one of the largest studies showing that the vaccine is safe and effective. So, per, so primarily um, this study showed that not only do pregnant individuals mount as good of an immune response to the vaccine as a non-pregnant person, those antibodies were then found in the cord blood, which is essentially the baby's blood. That's the umbilical cord attached to the baby. It was found those antibodies in the cord blood and in breast milk. So this is showing again, that we know that pregnant women can mount as good of an immune response as somebody who's not pregnant 
and those antibodies can transfer to the baby. I wouldn't really go into this with any of our patients or clients, but this is again showing those specific antibodies and showing that there's actually a sustained response of these antibodies that are found in the breast milk. So this is up until six weeks, but it was showing the IgA and IgG antibodies found in breast milk. And this was published in the Journal of American Medical Association. Dr. Bogler, we have, said, yep. we've got one question yeah. from just pre yeah. mind. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, uh, so Charlie, uh, yeah. so you said that the antibodies can be transferred from the breast milk. So, for yeah. example, a mother, a pregnant woman, she got the vaccine first dose, and then her due date is before her second dose. So, yeah. yeah so, still, she can transfer the antibodies to her uh, to her kid. So, she got the first dose in pregnancy. You said yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She and can. So, there's actually a recent study that came out this week that two weeks after even just the first dose, there were mm -hmm. high levels of antibodies found to be transferred through the placenta and found in the core blood. Okay, so that's what she requested, if she can take both of the vaccine before uh, her yeah. due date, she was requesting yeah. that. So I at that time, I was not sure and I referred her to public health. So still, if she has one shot and after, after her due date, when she gave birth to the kid, she can still transfer the antibodies to the breast milk. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. And especially okay. if she were to get that second dose while breastfeeding, we mm -hmm. know that antibodies do get transferred into breast milk. Okay. The thing is, we know that the transfer through the placenta and to the baby is highest in pregnancy. So although it might not be as high after, it can mm -hmm. still transfer through breast milk. It's just that we know that the transfer is much, much higher in utero through the placenta while still pregnant. Um, but just after that first dose, Mm -hmm. Also, depending on when she got it, mm -hmm. um, we know that the transfer is very high, even after the first dose, likely. Obviously, okay. after the second dose would be even higher, but we are mm -hmm. showing studies that even after the first dose, it's quite high in terms of the antibody transfer. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Another Bell, question? We have two quick questions in the, yeah, um, in the totally. chat. The, what is the sample size for this study? Uh, if you're able to share that. And then the second is, can pregnant women get the first dose from the first month of her pregnancy? Yeah. Okay. So I was going to leave the first trimester stuff towards the end, but I am happy to go through it if you want. I'll talk about it with this study specifically right here. So, um, because it's a very good question about the first trimester. Um, so let me just talk about this, the safety, because first of all, we were talking about the effectiveness. So let me just recap for a second. So we know that pregnant people mount as good of an immune response and we know those antibodies transfer. And there's now been, there's not just one study that shows, I know there was a question about sample size. There's not just one study that shows antibodies transfer. There are now multiple studies that show. And I can actually, if you want to send a list, of those studies that are showing transfer, transferable antibodies through the cord blood and in breast milk. Um, but so that's all in terms of effectiveness. But what I find a lot of the patients wanna know is, but what is the safety? Okay, so I know it's effective, but what is the safety? And can I get it in first trimester, just like you asked? So I just wanna point out to this one study that was published just a few weeks ago at the end of April. Um, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's based out of a registry, an active surveillance program in the United States called VSAFE, and where over 100,000 pregnant women have received the COVID-19 vaccine in their pregnancy. And a subset have been registered into this study looking at the safety. So what are the pregnancy outcomes and the birth outcomes in pregnant women who received the vaccine? And they looked at the live births of these patients, a smaller subset of these patients. And there were no safety signals in terms of pregnancy outcomes or birth outcomes. So adverse pregnancy or birth outcomes. The thing is most of those patients who have delivered received their vaccine in the third trimester. So we can now confidently say that there are no safety signals in pregnant women who receive the vaccine in their third trimester. However, those patients who received it in their first trimester haven't yet delivered. 
So we can't say as confidently that we have such good data to support safety in first trimester. So the thing is, is that's where a discussion needs to be had with your patient. SOGC, so our Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, recommends that pregnant women should get the vaccine in any trimester and any of those vaccines. But when I speak to patients, I just want to go over the data that we have right now, that the safety data that we have currently is primarily for the third trimester, but there is no reason why we feel it would be unsafe in first trimester. We just don't have that data yet. And I suspect over the next few months, we will start to have data from the first trimester. We have other data to help us feel safer to recommend it in first trimester, meaning animal studies. So we have uh, studies done on mice and rats that looked at um, all trimesters and there were no teratogenics or developmental abnormalities whatsoever in those animals that received the vaccine in first trimester. We also have data from the initial vaccine trials. Um, so the initial mRNA, Pfizer, Moderna vaccine trials, they did not include pregnant women in their initial trials. Right now they are, um, there are studies including pregnant women, but we don't, don't have that data yet. But even in those initial trials where they did not include pregnant women, there were women that inadvertently got pregnant or got pregnant right after the vaccine. And again, and they've delivered since then, and there have been no safety or adverse pregnancy outcomes in those women who have inadvertently got pregnant basically in their first trimester um, and received the vaccine, sorry, in their first trimester. So we have other data to make us feel safe that this vaccine would be you know, quite safe to receive in first trimester. We just don't have this sort of data that I'm pointing to you right now from the New England Journal of Medicine and through Be Safe, really showing in large numbers the safety in all trimesters. I hope that kind of makes sense, but you know, I think, for me, the way I talk about it with my patients, I know we could give a blanket statement, it's safe in all trimesters, you know, but then patients also often want to know, but what about the first trimester? Really, what is the data? And I, and I am honest, we don't have that data yet for the COVID-19 vaccine in first trimester, but biologically speaking, there's no reason why it would be unsafe when we, we know a lot about the vaccine and we can talk about this towards the end. And we do have data from animal studies, from women who inadvertently got pregnant in the first vaccine trials. Um, and we will have more data over the next few months. And at the end of the day, that person, if their risk of acquiring COVID-19 is quite high, um, or even not as high, and it's just there and high, they might want to get it even in their first trimester to protect themselves. Um, and that's where shared decision-making risk-benefit discussions are so important. Did that answer that a little bit? I know it's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but. I think that's really helpful with the, in spite of all the complexity and nuance there. So thank you, Dr. Bogler. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so this is again a little bit more about that uh, New England Journal of Medi Medicine study showing that what's interesting is a lot of people ask about, well, will my side effects be greater in pregnancy to the COVID-19 vaccine? And actually, I would point to this study and show that there were no differences in side effect profiles in pregnant individuals who received that vaccine compared to non-pregnant individuals. And actually, in the pregnant population, there might be less systemic side effects so that's what they found actually. So less reports of fever, muscle aches, feeling unwell compared to non-pregnant people who got the vaccine. And we've actually seen this with other vaccines that we give in pregnancy as well. What pregnant people have potentially more side effects of are local, local side effects, a so local pain at the injection site compared to a non-pregnant person. So that's, that's really interesting, I find, because I think people are worried about getting a fever in pregnancy. And I'm not saying that they won't, but it's actually, not higher or even lower than a non-pregnant person. Um, and I'm just seeing if there's anything else from this study specifically. Um, I think that's it. Um, I just wanna you know, bring this back to what was going on um, in Ontario and what we were seeing you know, all over the world. Basically what happened because there was limited data um, on pregnancy and the vaccine because pregnant individuals were not included in the initial trials. What happened was that, you know, there were statements basically saying that uh, pregnant women should not be potentially eligible for the vaccine at the beginning. 
but that has really evolved and it's evolved for a few reasons. One, because then we started to see that pregnant individuals were getting more sick from COVID-19. And number two, we started to get real world safety data about the vaccine in pregnancy, um, primarily from the United States and Israel. But from the United States now, now that we have over 100,000 pregnant women who have received the vaccine and the safety data is coming in, um, and the effectiveness of these vaccines in pregnancy are coming in, this has really changed at a policy level to now really prioritize pregnant women for the COVID-19 vaccine. And in Ontario, pregnancy was prioritized back at the end of April um, for this exact reason. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and our National Advisory Committee on Immunization, Immunizations has also evolved and that's what's happening, right? The pandemic so much has evolved. We're learning so much more and our immunization guidelines are also evolving and changing as the data comes out. Um, and as of May 3rd, this is the current statement from NACI. Number one, it says the COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to pregnant individuals after a risk assessment and informed consent. And that's going through what we're talking about right now. What do we know about the vaccine? What do we know about the risks of COVID-19 in pregnancy? And that's why it's important to understand this stuff so you can confidently have this discussion with your patient. And to me, this is where shared decision-making becomes so important because you know, it's important to understand that person in terms of their risk profile, their values, how they feel about vaccines in general, and together make a decision that best fits their, you know, best fits their values. Um, and that's, I guess, where all of you come in. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that NACI did say is that they do prefer the mRNA vaccine over the adenovirus vector vaccines. And I, I'm not gonna get into adenovirus vector vaccines because right now, as we know, it's been paused for first doses here in Ontario and the Johnson & Johnson is not yet uh, readily available to us. So getting into a little bit about hesitancy and acceptance. Um, I love some of the 19 to zero slides that have been made and I'm sharing this with permission from Dr. Noah Ivers, who's a, a good friend of mine and colleague, that concerns and hesitancy are natural and hesitancy doesn't stem from ignorance. Um, and I think this group probably can speak about this more than I can because you guys have really been at you know the forefront of all of this, really speaking to people and talking about hesitancy. And that's why actually this, I love being here because I want to hear what you're all facing and the questions that you experience um, so that together we can sort of combine the data and the knowledge and, you know, the hesitancy that we hear and create answers that make the most sense. Um, this is just a slide showing that vaccine acceptance has actually increased. Um, over time here in Canada, which is really nice to see as well. Obviously, there's still a huge issue with vaccine hesitancy um, in certain populations in certain areas in Canada, but it is nice to see that the acceptance rates have gone higher uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, vaccine hesitators tend to be, you know, in Canada, younger, a visible minority, have children, uh, a lower household income, and just simply unsure of vaccine safety. Racialized Canadians have suffered disproportionately during the pandemic and have a higher distress of vaccines. This is, um, I don't know why that yellow line is there, I apologize, but this is just from my own practice um, at St. Michael's Hospital of 82 uh, prenatal patients. This was in April when we found out that pregnant individuals were prioritized for the vaccine, we called them right away, um, like the next day over two days. And uh, we didn't reach everyone. Um, as you can see, 20%, we had to leave a voicemail, but 27% um, were hesitant or declined the vaccine. Um, just to give an idea, this is just one sample. This is, these are my patients at St. Michael's Hospital, but, um, it kind of does give a little bit of an indication of where we're at. Um, and I just wanna um, highlight this study. It's out of Ottawa and um, I'm collaborating on it and it's looking at vaccine attitudes. 
um, towards um, the COVID-19 vaccine specifically, not just in pregnancy, but in those who are thinking of conceiving in the next year, pregnant or who are breastfeeding. And um, you can take a screenshot if you want of the QR code, but I, it would be really wonderful if you could share this study with your communities. Um, I did post it on Pandemic Pregnancy Guide and we have almost 3000 responses, but I do worry that Instagram is a very, um, it's a very selected group. It's a biased group. Again, these are individuals uh, who speak English, uh, tend to be higher socioeconomic status. And uh, I just worry that this is not representative of uh, the communities that we work with. Um, but again, it is still important to do this study and it is easiest to disseminate on social media, but there is a downside to that as well. Um, this is early results from the study. Um, this is from two, like 2,600 responses. We have more, but um, since then, but I looked at this about two to three weeks ago and among preg pregnant respondents, um, it's interesting that 70% said that they would receive the COVID vaccine during pregnancy and 66% while breastfeeding. And I'm just curious to see what other people are feeling when they're having these discussions with patients, if they feel that it's that high or if they're sensing something different to this. And among breastfeeding participants, approximately 81% said they would receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I didn't mean to click so quickly, but this is just a Q&A that I did with uh, Jesse Cruikshank. I don't know if anyone's familiar with her. She's like a Canadian TV celebrity. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's, you know, it's fun to debunk these myths and talk to people about it and think of creative ways to do this. And this was on her Facebook platform. Um, and I think we shouldn't shy away from these questions like, but is it safe in first trimester and what's going to happen to future fertilities? I think we should talk about it and think of creative ways to have those discussions. I don't know why all my screens have a yellow mark in it. It's very peculiar, <laughs> but this is um, a study that we published in Canadian Medical Association Journal of a shared decision making framework to have um, with our clients and our patients. and. You know, I'm just showing it now because I, I bet most of you already have these types of conversations. And what I really like to highlight is um, going through the patient's values and goals, you know, and then combining that with the data and evidence and then together, sorry, coming up with a decision together that best fits that person's values. And I think this is very, very important. Um, and in here, you know, talking to them about their individual's concerns, their risk thresholds, what are the benefits for that person? What is their desire to be vaccinated? And you know those individual considerations, their mental health, um, and then talking about the data and actually providing them with the data. If you go on to PCMCH, Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health, they also have a wonderful decision aid. It's less about a discussion between the patient and um, the ambassador or the physician. It's more about them looking at this decision aid themselves and it helps them guide through making um, a decision that again, best fits their individual profile. I think it's a wonderful decision aid and I, I do believe that they've translated it. I am not 100% sure if that's available, but I do know they were working on translating it into uh, several languages. So now I thought we would, oops, sorry. Can you see my screen? Ah, I lost, sorry about that one second. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We can still see the screen. Yeah, but I, oh, here we go, sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I thought we would go through the top questions um, that I've been receiving <laughs> with yellow marks all over them again. But I'm also happy to open this up and hear from everyone else um, some of the questions they've been receiving as well. So I'll, I'll go through it, but I'm sure, oh, there's lots of questions coming in. Um, 
try, you might be able to see if any of these questions actually translate into my top 10 questions. Yeah, there's two that we haven't uh, had a chance to speak to. Um, the first yep. is around sort of pre-pregnancy fertility questions and yep. about the antibodies and the uh, how long they last um, and, and whether or not it, you know, how long it stays with you um, uh, in that period. Yep. yep. Okay. So let's go back to the antibodies for a second. Hold on. I just want to show something. Are you, okay, give me a second. I'm not as good at, at Zoom as I thought I was. Um, give me one second. I want to show this study again. Can you see my screen or no? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Okay. So you can see this now. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to leave it in. I'm going to leave it in the. Um, in this view. So basically this study specifically, it was out of the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. It's a very small sample, but this study in human milk actually showed quite sustained um, um, antibody response up to, I think it was almost 60 days. So this is in breast milk. In, um, in the placenta, we, you know, we don't know yet how, how sustained these antibody responses are. Um, this one was specifically at six weeks after vaccination. This one was um, published in JAMA. But I think the bottom line is we know these antibodies transfer. We know there is somewhat of a same, sustained re response, whether it's several weeks to maybe a few months after the first vaccine, but we don't know actually um, how sustained that antibody response will be and how that actually confers immunity in the baby. So we don't have that data yet. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Uh, and then the okay. other question was around sort of fertility uh, and yeah. women who are considering. Yeah. And we've got that as yeah. question number six. Yeah, so let's do it. Let's go through these. Um, so this is what I wanted to kind of open it up, but also talk about some of the, some of the ways I answer the most common question. And I'll tell you the most common question that I personally receive is, but we don't have long-term data on the vaccine if given in pregnancy. Um, I, I think I get that question every day and I'm not sure if other people get that same question. You could give a thumbs up or a hands up if that's the common question, the most common question that you receive. But these are some of the answers that I provide when I get that question. And what I typically do is I validate that question. Yes, thumbs up. Um, and I say, you know, we would love to have years of data. We'd always like more data than less. But we have decades of research on other vaccines and vaccines in general, and we know how they work. And I think people are worried about, and I, we spoke about this last week, but this was you know, an expedited vaccine. It was so fast, it was so rapidly reviewed. And what I do say is that the mRNA vaccine has been studied extensively actually for the last 10 years, and we know really well how it works. And I want to emphasize that we have lots of data from other vaccines that we give in pregnancy, specifically the whooping cough vaccine and the flu vaccine. And we actually have long-term data specifically for the whooping cough vaccine, the tetanus vaccine that we give in pregnancy, we have long-term data um, in those children who were born to moms who received the whooping cough vaccine in pregnancy. And I, I just, I think we, we're not also aware of all the data and the risks and safety profiles of other vaccines that we've given in pregnancy. This is not the first vaccine we've given in pregnancy. And we have very good safety data and long-term data actually in the, of those vaccines given in pregnancy. So I, I like to use that as a, a way to reassure people. Um, and, but it's true, right now we don't have long-term data of the COVID-19 vaccine in pregnancy. It's not possible, you, you know? This is the first time we're giving this vaccine in pregnancy, but we have many reasons why to feel very comfortable giving it in pregnancy. Um, I do emphasize that it's not a long-term daily medication. This is a one-time thing where your body's immune system develops immune memory. And so any side effects that you might have from the vaccine are basically your body making that immune memory. And that happens within a few weeks of getting the vaccine. And it's not long-term, just like you develop a fever after getting the vaccine, you're not gonna have a long-term fever. These are very short-lived side effects. Um, 
depending if I know my patient and I don't know how well you know uh, your clients, sometimes they say the long-term side effects are that you're more likely to be healthy and alive if you get the vaccine. But I, do, I wouldn't say that with anyone. I would only say it with somebody that I probably you know, have a relationship with. Um, I also tell them that the vaccine doesn't stay in your immune system. It quickly gets broken down. It's not a live vaccine. And we have lots of animal studies that show there are no reproductive or developmental concerns. Um, and again, there are a number of women who inadvertently got pregnant in the initial vaccine trials that I was speaking about, and there were no safety signals. And now over 100,000 pregnant women in the US have received the COVID-19 vaccine with no safety signals to date. And the bottom line is, is really it's getting back to that shared decision-making about the fact that we know that COVID-19 risk is higher in pregnancy and getting the vaccine reduces your risk of getting severely sick. And you know, when we talk about long-term implications, if somebody, especially in their third trimester were to get severely sick from COVID-19, their chances of having a preterm birth are higher. And we know there are long-term complications you know, potentially with preterm birth. So when I, when people are talking about, but what are the long-term, you know, issues? Well, there are long-term issues potentially with developing quite severe illness from COVID-19 and having a preterm birth, unfortunately. So also putting that into perspective too. Um, I would love to hear from the group, um, you know, what people are saying and what people have found helpful. Um, if anyone wants to just unmute and, and talk about what they have found, or maybe they haven't found anything or they don't know what to say, but that's okay too. I knew a couple people that were very like distrustful um, about the, vi uh, the vaccine in general, but when I told them that, you know, pregnant women are getting the vaccine, they like kind of argued about it. They're like, no, they're not giving it to people that are pregnant. And I was like, yes, they definitely are. And they're not going to put people in the position, pregnant women, if they wouldn't want, like, they're not going to give that to the general public. So I was trying to like tell her, like, this is something that's safe. They're not going to implement it to people that are high at risk if they didn't think that it was safe to give everyone. But she was a little bit distrustful at the beginning. She's like, you know, pregnant women are not getting it. And I told her like pregnant women and breastfeeding women are getting the vaccine. So would it be helpful if you shared that American data saying that over 100,000 pregnant women have received the vaccine? Do you think that that would be helpful saying that the sheer number of people that have received it? I think to some extent, but some people have already have their mind set when it comes to this. It doesn't matter what data they you kind of show them, especially if they have influences from people in their internal environment. They already have like their mind frame set on, I'm not getting it. I don't trust it because we did develop like get deeper into the conversation about vaccines, right? Because I was giving them an example, like they, they say like, okay, there's a high chance of surviving. Why would I get the vaccine? But there's other vaccines like chickenpox, like that vaccine. There's a high survival rate of if you get chickenpox, but people still take it because in general, you don't want to catch stuff, something like that, right? So people kind of are making up reasons to justify them not getting it. And that's why you have like a lot of people that have been making up these theories and people are like um, starting to believe them and tie on to them because they've already made up their mind that they don't want to get it. So if you even release information, they're going to find something that is, they're going to say is contradictory. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. And I've, I've felt that as well, but we have to, I guess, figure out, you know, cause for some people it will work and some people it won't. And I've personally found saying the number of people who have received the vaccines in the United States has been like, oh, wow, like I didn't know it was such a high number. And I will say that um, uh, there is funding now at a national level. We will start to be tracking the number of pregnant women who have received the vaccine in Canada. Um, it was just funded as of last week. So I think over the next few weeks probably or towards the end of the month we will start to be able to say how many pregnant women in Canada have received the vaccine and so for some people it will work and it will be you know that will be a supportive fact and for some people they, they don't care how many people receive the vaccine for some people it does give that level of reassurance that they're not the only one going through this um, anyone else anyone else anything in here that has worked or something else that you have found Helpful. Yeah, it work, it's works. Uh, for example, uh, when they ask me, uh, 
it's not, sh I'm not sure about vaccine because that's a uh, new research. Then I asked them, okay, when you're going to dentist, nobody ask uh, what you have in anesthetic and everybody get anesthetic, yeah? So I think it's a better vaccine. It's, it's safety than COVID. Yes, and you're right about that. And you're right, given what we know and given how, given what we know now about COVID-19 and how sick some pregnant women have gotten, especially in their third trimester. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's again, a risk benefit discussion about that. And yes, we do understand that the risk is much higher now developing uh, and contracting COVID-19 and getting quite sick from COVID-19 in pregnancy. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. We could always go back to this. And this is about the first trimester. Should I avoid the first trimester? And I think I spoke about this a little bit, but I do wanna say, you know, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists has made a statement saying that the vaccine is safe in any trimester. And that, you know, and that is, you know, the right statement, especially during the third wave and especially what we were seeing in terms of the risk. I will say, and this is my personal bias, <laughs> I'm not SOGC and I don't represent SOGC, that I do think it's worth having a little bit more of a nuanced conversation with people, especially in their first trimester, simply because it's a little bit of, and I don't know how, how, how everyone feels about the first trimester, but some people are a little bit more cautious in the first trimester just because the rate of miscarriage is higher in general in the first trimester. Some people don't do pap tests or don't exercise as much and are a little bit more hands-off in the first trimester because there's a concern around misassociating the vaccine and miscarriage. Um, and I, there is no data to suggest that it's unsafe in first trimester whatsoever. And if somebody is a healthcare worker or very at high risk of exposure, there might be a very good, good reason to get it in first trimester for that reason. But I do think it's worth talking about with the person, like what are their concerns and fears? Are they more worried in first trimester? Because the last thing I would want is somebody who is very concerned about the first trimester. Maybe they've had multiple miscarriages. Maybe they're at risk of getting another miscarriage in first trimester and then misassociating the vaccine with a miscarriage. That's all. But in general, it is thought to be quite safe at any trimester. And I hope, you know, um, at the end of the day, I do think, especially around first trimester, it probably is wise for the person to, to talk to their healthcare provider. Um, which vaccine should I get? I'm not gonna go into this anymore because now that AstraZeneca was paused for first trimester, but there was lots of discussions around this. But in general, even if it is, even if we potentially do get Johnson & Johnson or other Astra, um, adenovirus vector vaccines, the bottom line is, NASI has recommended that the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna are the preferred choice in pregnancy, simply because we have an abundance of data now showing that they are safe in pregnancy. Um, and that's really the main reason why, not because of any other reasons or there's something wrong with the AstraZeneca vaccine in pregnancy. The risk of clots with the AstraZeneca vaccine is a completely different mechanism to the types of clots we see in pregnancy. We don't think they're actually higher in pregnancy, those types of rare clots that we were seeing from the viral vector vaccines. But it's simply because we have so much safety data now on the mRNA vaccines in pregnancy because of those 100,000 women who have received the vaccines in the United States and some of those studies that I was referring to previously in terms of the safety profile. Um, this is a big question we've been getting is how long to wait to conceive after receiving the vaccine. Um, and this kind of ties into the first trimester question as well. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization says to wait 28 days after the last, after the second vaccine. That being said, and again, I don't represent NASI, but I do represent um, probably uh, a lot of practitioners who practice, I would say quite practically and understand the data and are, are sort of, you know, not representing a societal guideline organization. I would say that most people 
do not actually feel that that is a necessary length of time to actually wait to conceive. And that's simply because this was just an abundance of caution. And this statement was put out right at the beginning when vaccines were eligible before all of the safety data emerged. And I think they probably need to update their guideline personally. I think it's just from an abundance of caution to wait. And they use that 28 days because that's the recommendation they use for live vaccines, which we don't recommend in pregnancy generally. But these vaccines are not live vaccines. And to say to wait 28 days, but also say that you can give it in first trimester is sort of a contra addiction when you think about it. Um, and so I would say somebody who's going through fertility treatments um, or who's anxiously, anxiously trying to get pregnant, um, I would say to get the vaccine at any time and not necessarily to wait specifically 28 days um, to try to conceive. Um, but this is what the National Advisory Committee on Immunization says. I think they'll change it soon, is my feeling. Um, and then in terms of other vaccines, so if you look again at the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, it has this window period to wait two weeks from a different vaccine to get the COVID-19 vaccine, and then to wait four weeks from the COVID-19 vaccine to get a different vaccine. And the reason this is important in pregnancy is because of the whooping cough vaccine, which we typically recommend in pregnancy. And so many women are saying, but what about you know, the Adisa whooping cough vaccine and how do I time it with the COVID-19 vaccine because it can get a little bit confusing. Um, so just to uh, take it back a step, um, the whooping cough vaccine is something we recommend for every pregnancy between 27 weeks and 32 weeks pregnant. So it's enough of a window where they should be able to time the COVID-19 vaccine around. And just for everyone to know the whooping cough vaccine Adicel is something we recommend in pregnancy, not really to protect the mom, actually, because we're not seeing outbreaks of the whooping cough um, in terms of really impacting uh, reproductive age women. And also they might have received the vaccine within the last 10 years. But the reason we give the vaccine in pregnancy is actually to protect the baby, because we see a boost of antibodies in pregnancy that then gets transferred through the placenta to the baby and then protects the baby in the first two months of life. So again, when we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine, this is not a new thing um, in terms of recommending vaccines in pregnancy. This is exactly the reason why we routinely recommend in every single pregnancy to receive the whooping cough vaccine to actually give protection to the baby. So I think for the COVID-19 vaccine, not only are you protecting yourself from, from developing severe outcomes of COVID-19, but again, now we're having, we, sh we see data showing that those antibodies are transferred through the placenta to the baby. And yes, this is new data and we still need data to show how long do those antibodies last for the baby and how much protection does it actually give to the baby? We're not there yet, but we're also not surprised to see that there's antibodies given what we know from other vaccines. Um, yeah, Dr. Any Bo, about that? yeah. Uh, there's a question. Um, is there any data indicating any other vaccines given for other illnesses have harmed child development or reproductive health? I've heard people okay. express hesitancy due to vague concerns about COVID because of other vaccines where there have been problems historically. No, nothing. The only thing we typically recommend not giving in pregnancy is a live vaccine. Um, and, and sometimes we do, there are indications when we sometimes do, but in generally we recommend avoiding live vaccines. These are not live vaccines. So we generally give the flu vaccine in pregnancy. We give the whooping cough vaccine in pregnancy. Now we're recommending the COVID-19 vaccine. And for the, the whooping cough and the flu vaccine, we do have data because we've been doing this for years now that we've been giving these vaccines. We do have more longer term data on these vaccines and we have followed those children and there have been no developmental um, outcomes in those children. And I think people in general forget about those vaccines that we give in pregnancy and that we do have long-term data on those vaccines. And I understand the mRNA vaccine is a little bit different um, in terms of the vehicle that it's you know, given. It's a little bit different, but the the basics of immunology and how that vaccine actually works is generally the same. And we know how antibodies work and, we, and you know, and we have long-term data from other vaccines. 
So what is considered a live vaccine? Yeah, so the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and the chickenpox vaccine. We okay. don't recommend those in pregnancy. These are not live vaccines. Even the, the flu, the flu, there is a flu live vaccine too, like the nose yeah. spray. Yes, but yeah. the flu vaccine that we give in pregnancy is not a live vaccine. Yes, yes, I know, but I'm saying that, uh, you know, there is a flu uh, live vaccine, which is not recommended in pregnancy also. Um, and the other thing I want to say about, uh, we can talk about it in another question, but a lot of people, you know, have this concern that is the vaccine going to transfer through the placenta or is the vaccine going to transfer through the breast milk? That kind of is another question that comes up as well. And we actually have data now showing that it doesn't. Um, and I think this is something very reassuring for patients to hear as well. Um, it was one of my last slides, but this actually study just came out this past week um, on specifically in pregnancy. So when they looked at, I think it was 80 something, 84 pregnant individuals who got the vaccine in their pregnancy. And they looked at the cord blood. Okay, so then when the baby's born, they looked at the cord blood, that umbilical cord blood, which is, which is essentially the baby's blood. And they looked to see um, what antibodies were in um, that cord blood. And um, not to get too sophisticated about things and complicated, but essentially, I'm trying to think about how to explain it, how I would explain it to somebody. Essentially, the only, and the only thing that was transferred was a specific antibody, IgG. That's the specific antibody. And there weren't antibodies um, specifically IgM, which is an acute antibody, it basically shows us, and I, I have to think about a better way to explain it, and I was just reading the study yesterday, it basically shows us that because only a specific IgG long-term antibody is transferred and not this IgM antibody, that the vaccine itself does not get transferred. Um, and we actually looked at breast milk as well in a study out of Israel that looked at um, breast milk four to 48 hours after a woman is vaccinated with the vaccine. And there were no mRNA components in the breast milk either, showing that the vaccine itself is not transferred through the breast milk. So there are lots of studies kind of showing now that the, the vaccine itself is not transferred. The only thing that is transferred are the antibodies that the mom basically produces after getting the vaccine. That the IgG and IgA specific antibodies can be transferred through the placenta and in breast milk. Okay, um, let's talk about fertility and menstrual cycle. I don't know how much time we have, um, but I do wanna talk about this because <laughs> I know this is a very big question. So, and I know I spoke about it a little bit on last week or two weeks ago, whenever that was, it seems like a long time ago, but I think it was just last week. Wow. So there have been anecdotal reports um, that women do have some changes in their menstrual cycle after getting the vaccine. There is no study yet looking at this specifically. There is a study starting looking at this, but there's no re results yet. Um, these are anecdotal reports that women have said that they're um, after receiving the vaccine, they've had some spotting, some heavier periods, and um, more painful, specifically the first cycle after the vaccine, potentially the second cycle. These are short-term, short-lived um, menstrual cycle changes after the vaccine that are not long-term. And it's anecdotal. There's no study actually definitively saying there is a connection between the, between the COVID-19 vaccine and menstrual changes. But I do tell patients this and say you might notice some spotting so that they're not alarmed and so that they're aware and they're fully aware of potential side effects just like they're aware of a potential fever but again this is not long term and has nothing to do with future fertility having a bit of a change in your menstrual cycle right after getting the vaccine has no indication of future fertility whatsoever and no impact on future fertility there have been concerns raised about, well, will this impact future fertility, the vaccine in general? And I think somebody was asking this question earlier on. Um, 
I will suggest going to our pandemic pregnancy guide because I did a, a interview with a geneticist um, out of the States. She's wonderful. Her name is Alex Danis and she breaks down sort of how did this theory come to be? Like, where did people come up with this, that this could impact future fertility? And I want to say one thing, this concern about future fertility has come up with other vaccines as well. Um, Anti-vaccine groups have typically used this fear about future fertility as a way to, you know, elicit fear in people. And it is um, a common thing that people do jump on as a way to fear monger and basically say that, what about future fertility? And I think it's very hard for reproductive age women not to be concerned about that once they see that, even if they know it's not true, once they see it in the media or see something, you know, even if it's at the back of their mind now, when they're thinking about the vaccine, they're saying, but what, what if that person's right? Even if there's no basis to it, there's no fact to it. And I have to say this myth that came out about future fertility has been completely debunked. And this video that I did with um, Dr. Alex Dana, she, she goes into why they even thought that this could be an issue and why they use this. Um, because there's like a five, if you look here, like five amino acids that are similar between the spike protein that the vaccine um, codes for and a protein called syncytion one that's important for placental development. And this person that put out this claim on a, it's not a reputable, reputable website whatsoever, said that the fact that there's some similarities between these amino acids, between these two proteins, well, then how do we know that our antibodies, just like they fight against the spike protein, if there's some similarity between this protein for the placenta, how do we know our antibodies are not gonna fight against that placental protein? But you have to go back to biology 101, like because just five little amino acids out of a whole building block is not enough for an antibody to, to find similarities. Um, you know, not only do you need lots of similarities in the sequence, but that protein then needs to form into the shape. It's a very complicated process. And if you looked at all of our proteins in our bodies, so many of our proteins have little similarities. So the antibody would then potentially attack all of our proteins all over our body. It just doesn't make any sense. And we're not seeing higher rates of miscarriage either, which is what this would essentially claim to be. Um, we haven't seen higher rates of miscarriages in first trimester in people with COVID-19. So essentially you can go into the science if you want and really look at the reason why this is not biologically plausible whatsoever. Uh, I don't expect most people to do that. The thing is, I think it's important to know that this really doesn't make sense biologically. And unfortunately it instilled a lot of fear um, and it's just simply not true. Um, people have asked the questions, what about higher rates of miscarriages in first trimester? I saw on the, you know, in CDC, there's higher rates of miscarriages. I think it's important to point out to people that miscarriage rates are high in general, nothing to do with COVID-19. And when they actually looked at the rates of miscarriage in first trimester compared to the background rates, if you look at this number, it's actually, whether it's the same or even lower in individuals who receive the vaccine. So again, I, don't, I, I think it's very possible that people who receive the vaccine had miscarriages in first trimester, but what's important is that different than the general population? Is that different than the baseline rate? Is that different than the number of miscarriages we typically see in reproductive age women? And the answer is no. And that's a common thing people will report. Well, haven't you seen the number of miscarriages um, reported on this website? And um, yes, there are miscarriages, unfortunately, but they're not higher than the general population. Um, this was the study that came out about uh, the vaccine not transferring through uh, breast milk. And this is a picture, I'm not gonna get into it, that the vaccine itself doesn't transfer through the placenta. The only thing that transfers is this IgG um, antibody. Um, let's skip this. This is another one, Alex Danis. I really love some of her TikTok videos. She talks about how the vaccine itself doesn't stick around in our bodies, um, but breaks down very quickly. And the only thing left really um, are your antibodies. And she just explains it in a really nice way. 
Um, and that's it. Sorry, I, I sort of uh, flew through everything, but I'm happy to take questions and open it up to discussion. Thanks, Dr. Blitter. That was incredible. There was so much rich content there, and I know that uh, this is really helpful for many of the ambassadors on the, the call today. We do have a, converse, a question in the chat about uh, future yeah. fertility in men, um, which came up last week, but it's good to kind of uh, talk about again. Yeah, yeah. So um, there have been studies showing um, actually that there are no increased risks of uh, fertility issues in terms of sperm quality or quantity after receiving the vaccine. However, there have been some uh, studies reporting that there can be um, issues with erectile dysfunction in men who actually get COVID-19 infection. So not the vaccine, but COVID-19 infection. So when people bring that up as a worry, I would say that I would be more worried as um, as a man to actually get COVID-19 infection in terms of future fertility because of erectile dysfunction um, implications potentially. So we're just a little bit after 11 and we said we'd go for an hour. Um, I'm gonna just check to see if there's more questions in the chat. Uh, your presentation was so comprehensive. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything else they wanna bring up, um, but we can maybe, if you're okay to do five, 10 more minutes of, of Q&A. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, for sure. I'm sorry. I know there's so much to talk about and I apologize. <laughs> and also this data has evolved and continues to evolve. Um, yeah. So, you know, I maybe there'll be more data on the fertility issue in, in men, you know, next week. But I have to, you know, why I feel very confident talking about this is because all the data that has come out has essentially supported um, previous data and it's just building on the current data and it continues basically bottom line to be supportive of the safety of the vaccine in pregnancy, that there is an increased risk for pregnant individuals if they um, get COVID-19 in terms of serious um, pregnancy and birth outcomes. Um, and we know that they're effective in pregnancy too and all the data just keeps on supporting it over the last few months. It is incredible how much data is coming out. Uh, it's such an interesting time in terms of science and we're all getting amazing lessons in um, the evolving nature of, the, of, of all of these interventions. Yep. Yeah. I'm curious to see if there's anything else in terms of um, when speaking to clients, if there's anything else, uh, other questions that come up that people are finding difficult to answer. Jasper has a yeah. question. I have a question comment. about the COVID. So, for example, somebody got the COVID and uh, not specifically to pregnancy as well, uh, for general. So how yeah. long should they wait to get their first dose? Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question. And that has also changed during the pandemic too. At first, people were saying wait three months because we think antibodies last about three months. Mm -hmm. But now really the recommendation is we're recommending about two weeks after uh, the illness subsides, you can get the vaccine. Um, and that's to, in the States, if certain people have been treated with a certain type of treatment that we don't even have here in Canada, then they need to wait three months. So in general here in Canada, about two weeks after symptom resolution uh, to get the first vaccine. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I have another question related to this. So I met a client yesterday and she was hospitalized due to COVID for three days and she still has uh she still is weak a uh, very weak to you know hit side effects so should sh should she wait two weeks or should she wait to get normal yeah. like yeah i think in in that situation it's really up to the person you could wait up to three months we do think the antibodies probably last up to three months so if it's uh, you know, if there's concerns about side effects of the vaccines and not knowing whether it's from, you know, the lingering um, uh, symptoms from the infection itself, she could decide to wait three months. Basically, what we're saying, it's really up to the person. You could wait to three months or you could get as soon as two weeks after. And if she is still feeling quite symptomatic from the infection, she might want to wait until she feels a little bit better. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem.
I've got one for you, Dr. Vogler. So this is off of Twitter. I read a Twitter thread a few weeks ago in one of the sort of third wave weekends in Alberta of somebody who shared that their partner had miscarried. They'd both been hospitalized with COVID. Um, do, do we know much about miscarriage after you've been infected with COVID, if there's any connections there? Like if you've been infected with COVID-19, are there higher rates of miscarriage? No. The large population data says no. There is no higher risk. Risk on a population level, a higher, as we were talking about before, there's actually no higher rates of miscarriage in people who actually get COVID-19 in first trimester compared to the baseline rate. Um, yeah, so that's it's the know, same so. as people get flu. You know, while yeah. uh, a pregnant woman gets flu in the first trimester. It's a risk for miscarriage. It's the same thing. So yes, it's just when they looked at the numbers at a big population level, the the rates of miscarriage from COVID nineteen are not actually higher than pre pandemic. Yeah. Is there any other burning questions that people are getting from the community, or or things that people are concerned about? Okay, well, um, Dr. Bogler, I want to thank you for going a couple minutes over time and staying with us for, for all this uh, amazing content. Um, we are recording this session so we can make it available. We'll send it out to folks um, uh, via email. Uh, those of you send uh, by Eventbrite or through our uh, usual channel on Tuesday mornings. Um, thank you so much for spending the time with us and helping us understand the science and get a really good fundamental grounding in this um and uh yeah we really appreciate this um on behalf of the whole group thank you um we uh, no problem continue to do our deep work. happy to answer if there's any questions that come out in future discussions when your team meets i'm happy for you to send me in an email and i can respond um or text me call me that's amazing. I'm, that's, I'm happy to do that as well. That's terrific. Uh, and folks, if you haven't had a chance and you are on Instagram, feel free to follow Pandemic Pregnancy. It's an amazing resource and it's a great one to share with uh, partic uh, participants and clients and residents that you're speaking to in the community. So, all right, everyone, enjoy your Wednesday and we'll see um, the uh, folks from the Community Ambassadors next uh, Network again next Tuesday coming up. Thanks very much and take care everyone. Thanks everyone. Keep up your amazing work. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.